We just praise you for that. And Father, as we open your word this morning, we just ask for the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> so, I haven't done this in a long time, and that's preach and teach Sabbath school. <laughs> the same time. (laughs) That's getting to be a little bit harder than it used to be. (laughs) Okay, open your Bibles to Romans 8, and we're still on verses 26 and 27 of Romans 8. The passage says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for, as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So this passage is basically uh, another work of the Holy Spirit. And all the way through from chapter 5 through chapter 8, Paul is dealing with one main theme, and that is the assurance of salvation, which is a very definite and biblical doctrine in the Bible. And this is what he is dealing with. And what he's doing in these chapters is he is giving these different assurances. And in chapter 8, he actually gives you the, uh, the, person, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, and the different things the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. And one thing we need to realize that we don't maintain our salvation, God maintains our salvation. So once you're saved, you don't start maintaining your own salvation. You, God is still, he's the one that's going to maintain your salvation. He's the one that's going to bring you through. And so the Holy Spirit is doing all kinds of things. God God works through the Holy Spirit. And all the different things the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives is maintaining our salvation, see, on the journey that we are going through. He keeps us there, see, by all these different things he does. And one of the difficulties we mentioned that we have is the difficulty of knowing the what to pray for at times, not how to pray, but the what. And so there's times that we really do not know what to pray for, and we just basically have nothing to say. In other words, that's what Paul is bringing out. We don't even have any speech in regards to this. We don't really understand what to say at that point. So what Paul is bringing here is he's bringing this passage in to give us encouragement and consolation is why he's bringing this passage in he's letting us know when we are plagued by our infirmities when we're plagued by our weakness the holy spirit is there and he is hasn't left us he's there helping us through those times he's always there helping us through those times so the thing we're looking at today now is going to be we're going to look at the comfort and consolation that is offered Uh, to us through the Holy Spirit. And one of the first things we need to remember as we kind of briefly review, number one, that we should not be discouraged by the difficulties which rise out of our infirmity, out of our weakness. We should never be discouraged by this. In the first place, I remind you that the infirmity, the weakness, is not something sinful in and of itself. It's not sinful in and of itself. It started that way in the garden. In other words, it was a result of the original sin. But these weaknesses and infirmities are not in and of themselves sin. So uh, don't be discouraged by these difficulties that we go through. We all go through them. Sometimes that's a lesson that's kind of hard to learn. Uh, Learning... What everybody goes through with different age groups, you know, you begin to to see these different things. And these sometimes can get to be discouraging, but we're not to let those become discouraging. Um, 
It results, as we saw from our sinful state and condition, being one of the consequences of the fall of man at the beginning. In this fact, we may take comfort. We should not feel that we have committed an act of sin because we do not know at any given moment what to pray for. That is not an act of sin if we don't know what to pray for. In fact, that is a normal Christian experience to occur. And number two, um, when you find yourself in a position that you do not know what to pray for as you ought, it is not a sign that you are not a child of God. Don't let Satan screw with your brain on that, trying to make you think that you're not a child of God because you don't know how to pray. You don't know how to talk to your daddy is what Satan is going to be uh, trying to uh, put a mind trip on you about. If you really don't know, understand how to talk to him. If you knew how to, t if you are really in Christ, you should know how to talk to your daddy. See, that's what Satan is, is bringing out. Don't buy into that. that. That's not the thing to buy into. And number three, because we do not know the what to pray for at all times, it's one of the proofs that we are a child of God. It is one of the proofs that we are a child of God. So keep those things in mind. Now notice what Paul is, is moving toward here. He says, how does this work out? The first thing that we are reminded of is that the Spirit himself helps us. So we have the Holy Spirit here. And in all these situations of trial and tribulation, of perplexity, and not knowing what to do, the Spirit is indwelling us permanently. He is living in us, and he's always there for us. And what Paul is bringing out here, this is a further action of the Spirit. It's a further action of the Spirit in our life. So in addition to all the other things that he is doing in our life, this is another action that he is doing. He is actually telling us what to pray for, the what that we should pray for. And then it says that the Spirit helps. And this is a very interesting word in the Greek. The Spirit helps us. It's actually made up of three words. And this, again, is characteristic of the Apostle Paul. He would take words, and boy, would he ever add things to them. Uh, to get his point across. So this is a very interesting word. It's made up of three parts. Uh, the first part means together. It occurs in the first part of the English word symphony. You know, when you have an orchestra, a symphony, that's the first part of the word. Uh, it occur, uh, the second word means over against, and the third word means to take. So the idea is that of two people taking something over against one another is what the meaning of the word means. It means one person gives a helping hand to another by taking hold, or, hold over against that person of the load that he is carrying. In other words, if I had a heavy log here this morning and I'm trying to carry this myself, now I'm gonna really be struggling and it's going to be a real burden to try to carry that log. But Dennis comes along and he says, let me help you. Let me grab the other end. And then all of a sudden that log gets a whole lot lighter. And that burden gets a whole lot easier to bear. And this is the picture that Paul is using as an illustration. That the Holy Spirit comes in alongside of us and he helps us carry the load, is what he's using in this word. Uh, the exact meaning of the word is illustrated in other parts of the Gospels. In the Gospel, the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, it's illustrated by Mary and Martha. It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. 
But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Now it's the same word that's being used here, this word help. In other words, I'm having to carry this whole load, this whole burden by myself, tell my sister to get off her duff and help me here, is what she was telling Jesus. In other words, she was carrying this whole thing by herself. However, Jesus didn't do that <laughs> in this case. But it's, it's the precise word we are dealing with here in verse 26, and it brings out something of the rich meaning of the word that Paul uses. He means that Christians are carrying heavy burdens and experiencing perplexing, perplexity in prayer, but the Spirit comes and gives them a helping hand. He takes hold of the burden with them in order to help them know what to pray for. And then again in the 11th chapter, at the end of the 11th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, we have this famous quote of Jesus. He says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the picture of the oxen pulling the plow. And we're one oxen, and Jesus is the other oxen. And so when we hook up, we yoke up with Christ, what happens to the heavy load? What happens to the burden? It gets really light. In fact, you might not even be aware that you even have a burden at that point because he's there pulling that load with you, see. He's there together with you. And so this is what Paul is illustrating here. Now notice what he says in this passage and what he doesn't. He doesn't say that we are passive, that we are doing nothing at all. He says the Spirit is doing what? Helping us. So he's not carrying the full load. He's helping us carry the load, is what he is doing there in this picture. And that's important that we understand that because there's a lot of people that just believe that you just let go and let God and you just sit there and wait for God to do something. And that is not New Testament sanctification. New Testament sanctification always involves our cooperation. Character development can never happen without your involvement in it. It would not be character development if you were not involved in this. So there is a part that, uh, that is our responsibility in this. And the Holy Spirit is the one that is empowering us, giving us the power to be able to do that on that. And so he comes in alongside and he helps us. And how does he do this? The way that he does this is that he makes intercession for us. Now this is a word that is very difficult to understand because it's got some very bad connotations. Because one of the meanings of intercession is pleading. Now in some cases that would be a good way of defining that. And in other situations, that would be a bl bad way of defining that. Uh, my, I cringe when I hear people say that Jesus Christ is pleading with the Father. I cringe at that. Because is Christ pleading with the Father? Does Christ have to change the Father's mind? Does he have to beg his father to help us? No. Never, 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 folks, does that happen. Because Jesus and the Father are one and they're always on the same page. 
They're always on the same page. So he doesn't have to be begging and pleading with his father to help us. Uh, Charles Hodge, a famous commentator on Romans, uh, wrote that basically uh, this word is figurative. It's a figurative word. It, it's just describing that Christ is dispensing all the benefits of his salvation to us. All the things that we need in our Christian walk. He is, as high priest, as our high priest, he is dispensing this through the Holy Spirit. But it's not this connotation of pleading, uh, you know, begging and that type of thing. Now, if we were to look at it from our angle, uh, think of a man walking along a road who suddenly comes upon a poor man in, in terrible trouble. He is being charged with an offense and is in great difficulties trying to defend himself. The man who arrives on the scene now begins to plead on behalf of the troubled man, either to his master who may be beating him or to a magistrate who, or to a king or to whomsoever it was that had brought the charge against the poor man. In other words, this other person is doing what? He's making intercession for this man. How does the Holy Spirit act in a similar way? It says that he, uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered, with groanings that cannot be uttered, in other words, these groanings are basically there is no speech for this. There is no words for this. Some have taken this passage and have said, oh, this is this secret language. This is this um, speaking in tongues, glossalia, all of this kind of thing. This is not what Paul is speaking about here at all. On that, He is just saying that we're in a state, we're in a position at this point that we don't have any words. We don't have any speech. Uh, the other way that Paul uses this is like in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Now this is different. Uh, he says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Here unspeakable refers to the Lord Jesus Christ and is used in the sense that no words can ever describe him adequately. Our, in, our vocabulary is entirely exhausted when it comes to describing Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, I knew a man, whether in body or out of body, I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, to paradise, and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. You ever wonder why you do not see a whole lot of descriptions and stuff about heaven in the Bible? That's why. Because you can't describe it. There is no language on this planet that can describe that. So it's unspeakable. So you, it's something that's beyond our capability of description. Uh, even in the case with Ellen White, when she had one of these visions and she saw heaven, uh, her descriptions, you know, what does that mean? See, grass that looks like silver, you know. Uh, I've never seen that. <laughs> See, it, it, it's, it's, it's a human trying to describe something that is undescribable, is what it is. Revelation, the streets are paved with Goal, but they are transparent. See, John was having a real hard time trying to describe that, that picture there because it's beyond description. So human language is entirely, totally inadequate to describe the happenings in heavens. And that is why we're so, told so little about it in the Bible. But this is not the word that Paul is using here. The word that Paul is using here is simply, we don't have any words at this point. We, we, we're wordless at this point, is what he is saying here. What is about this position of groaning? Does the Holy Spirit groan? Does God groan? Does Christ groan? 
Now, as a man, Christ groaned. And what is the problem here that Paul is dealing with here in this passage? It's because we don't have full knowledge. We do not have full understanding. Now I'll ask the question again. Does God groan? Does the Holy Spirit groan? I don't think so. In, in that light. Because the Holy Spirit has what? He has full knowledge. He has full understanding. God the Father has full knowledge. He has full understanding. So does the Son. So... There are those that say, you know, we can't really apply that to God. However, I think there is a way that you can apply this to the Holy Spirit. And that is, what does it mean? Obviously, it does not mean that the Holy Spirit is unable to articulate his concerns. Because he can articulate his concerns. Yet, if the idea of bearing a heavy burden is still in view... It may be that is what is, con is governing the, whole, the apostles' thought, a groan is appropriate to bearing a burden. A real burden bearer groans with you. I suggest that this is the image that Paul is using in this passage. In other words, the Holy Spirit gets down alongside of us. He doesn't need to groan. But he groans with us in our difficulty, in, in the burden that we are bearing. That was going to be my question. Yes. If we're groaning and the Holy Spirit is within us all the time, obviously he understands it, he feels it. Yes, yes. In other is words... That, is that sharing in our groaning? Yes, that's sharing in our groaning. Just like Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Yes, and just like uh, Jesus shared in our suffering. And we share in his suffering, see. So this is the same picture that we have uh, in this picture. In other words, when we're carrying that log and we're trying to carry that log by ourselves, we're going to be doing an awful lot of groaning. Well, the Holy Spirit gets on the other end of that log and he groans with us as we're carrying that log together, see. He is groaning with us. I have a question here. <laughs> Because it doesn't it also pertain to how much we're willing to allow that to happen? Yes. Because I think sometimes we don't allow the Holy Spirit to, you know, take part in that. Yes. In other words... And we continue to suffer yes. unnecessarily. Yes. And in other words, we are trying to carry the burden ourselves. And, and we often do that. Instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to come in there and take the other end of the log... We try to move that log ourselves. This is a question that I deal with on a pretty regular basis on Wednesdays, getting people to, to that threshold, to be able to release that mm -hmm. unwillingness, to be able to allow the control of the Holy Spirit, to allow that uh, sharing of that more, because that's where the true power comes from. Yes. That's what we talk about, you know, right. in, in sharing in our, holy, you know, our higher power of strength. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And what's neat about all of this is the Holy Spirit is an advocate. But we have someone else that's an advocate too. And who's that? Jesus Christ is an advocate. And what's neat about this is we got an advocate up there and we've got an advocate here. So we're double protected on this. Both ways. We have an advocate sitting at the right hand of the Father that is dispensing all that we need in our Christian walk and Christian life. And we have an advocate, advocate that is indwelling us, the Holy Spirit, that is always with us. When you think about that, it's two against one. Yes. There's no reason why we shouldn't get the victory. That's right. In fact, always remember, folks, you never fight for a position of victory. You never fight for a position of, of victory. You always fight from a position of victory. The victory has already been what? One. It's already been won. It is finished. 
So we never fight for a, for a position of victory. We always fight from a position of victory on that. So why then do we feel like losers? Because we... Because I'm telling you, people do this. Yes. People come from this as a, from a position of, mm -hmm. I'm losing, I'm losing, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. The point is, you are good enough. Mm -hmm. You have been good enough for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but to get somebody to plant, implant that in their mind side from a, coming from a place of victory, it's a pretty difficult thing for yes. a lot of people. It's, first of all, it's getting the person to believe it yeah. and to really believe it. Are you really believing God's word? Are you really believing what he's saying? And that's the first thing. And then the second thing is actually stepping out on that. See, and, and acting on it is the second thing. And, and that's where the struggle is really about all this. We don't really believe what God is telling us, see, about this. Tell yourself mm -hmm. you're stupid. You are stupid because you believe that. If you if you tell yourself you're smart, you, be, you get smarter because you begin to believe that. And I believe as Christians and helping people understand this, we need to be giving them positive feedback. It's not about telling them what's you know the, necessarily the details of it as much as this you know reminding people they are there. They're mm -hmm. already there. Yes. You know they don't have to become something, they're already there. Yes. In other words, we have to believe who we are, what we are, and where we are in Jesus Christ. That is the thing we need to understand. That's why the, the letter to Romans, Paul letter to Roman, is full of psychology. It is full of psychology, and it's biblical psychology. It's not Freud or any of that type of teaching. It's biblical psychology, and who, what, what, is, what is one of Jesus' names in Isaiah? He is the wonderful counselor. He is the wonderful psychologist. He is the wonderful psychiatrist. And you're going to find psychiatry in the Bible. Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace yes. Yes. Or it should be positive. Yes, right? absolutely. He's not telling us what we're not. He's telling us what we are. Yes, yes. That's what he wants us to understand. He wants us to know that we came from this position and now we are in this new position. And that's where we need to get our focus on because that's what Satan doesn't want you to believe. You know, Ellen White made a statement in Gospel Workers, She's, and I'm paraphrasing it right now, I have it written somewhere down, word for word, but she said that if we would only understand imputed righteousness, justification by faith, if we would only understand that, Satan's power would be broken. And folks, I know that to be true. I know that to be true. Because this is what Romans is all about. It's showing you that Satan's power is broken. Once you understand the gospel, his power is broken over you. He has no more control over you. He can't scare you. He can't beat you up. None of these different things can he do to you because he's lost that power over you. And that's just understanding justification, imputed righteousness, what's been put to our account. If we really understood that, we would uh, realize that he has no power over us uh, to take us down. He's always going to be trying. You know, he doesn't give up. He's, he is a real rascal when it comes to that. He keeps trying to, to discourage us and to play mind trips on us, all these different things. So we must never uh, take him lightly, folks, because he is there and he is very active in what he is doing uh, in, in this. 
So one of the things we need to un understand is that when we utter these groans, it's not just coming from us. The Holy Spirit is moving us to groan. He's moving us to groan. And then the Holy Spirit not only does that, uh, the Holy Spirit is working in us and is working in his operation uh, on us. Uh, so he has a regular work that he is doing in us all the time, and this is just another special work that he is doing in our life. There is a sense, therefore, in which we must say that the Spirit himself is the one who is making intercession. Not just Jesus, but the Spirit himself is making intercession. There would be nothing said at all. There would not even be a groan or a sigh if the Spirit did not come and take up this burden of ours and help us and act as our advocate and give us these petitions. In other words, he tells us what to say when we do not know what to pray for as we ought. He will give that to us. It is the Spirit himself ultimately who is making the intersection, but intercession. But, but because it is done through us, it is with groanings which are wordless and which are in that sense speechless. So this is one of the ways how he works in our life. Now some things as a result of this we need to always understand is that God hears this. God recognized this. Paul tells us here, uh, it says, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So, the, so God knows how the Holy Spirit is thinking and what he is thinking. So God is hearing all this. He knows all of this. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now what that really means is, in other words, what the, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life is according to the will of God. That's why he's there. It's because of God's will that he is there. He, God is the one who baptized you with the person of the Holy Spirit in the first place. So, the Holy Spirit is there to do God's will in our lives. He's, and, and God is not only searching, uh, you know, he knows the heart of the Holy Spirit, but he knows our heart. He understands our heart. We may not even be able to express anything at the moment, but he understands what's inside, deep down in, inside. He knows that about us, and he knows how to work with, with us in that. The heart says, Jeremiah is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Because he is God, he knows all that goes on in our hearts in the very deepest recesses of our being. There are, our, our, in our, our, there are ideas in our heart. There are wishes. There are aspirations. There are groanings. There are sighings the world knows nothing about. But God knows them because he is God. He knows everything. So, words are not always necessary. They're not always necessary because does God know what you're thinking? Absolutely. Now, I have a, a habit that I have, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but all of my praying is done here. I don't want him listening to it. <laughs> so I don't, you know... Often, I do not verbalize uh, audibly. I speak to God in my mind, is how I talk to him. Because I'm, I really don't want Satan in on the conversation on that part. Um, because he is not able to read our thoughts and what we are thinking. That's the thing we need to realize about him. So if you put it out there, then he knows exactly what you're up to. <laughs> on that. So, so God doesn't depend on, on sounds 
or upon formulated words, the slightest movement registered in the heart is heard by him on that. Uh, so always remember that God not only hears our groanings, he understands our groanings. But God not only understands, he approves of the ideas, he welcomes them, he likes them. Because they are coming from who? They're from the Holy Spirit working on us and in us. But we can even go further than that, and that is Paul uh, he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, and basically what is happening there is that because this is God's will for the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, one of the things that we can be assured of is this is just simply part of God's way of maintaining our salvation, of God's way of keeping us saved. All these different works that are happening in our life is part of his way of, of keeping that. The whole of salvation is God's plan, and this is a part of it. It is a part of our sanctification, a part of God's way of sustaining us and enabling us to persevere while we are in this evil world. God sends the Spirit, and the Spirit performs this work. He accomplishes a part of God's plan for us as his children. And so this is all that is, is constantly going on in our lives. Now, what we want to do before we close off these two verses, and we look like we may have time this morning, is we're going to be looking at some deductions to draw from these two verses. And number one, uh, prayer seems to be a problem with a lot of people. And one of the questions is, that, well, if God knows everything, and he knows our mind and all of these, these different things. Well, why bother to pray? Okay, it is not as much for God as it is for us. But what is really prayer all about? Communication. communication. It's about communication. So if you didn't pray, there wouldn't be much communication, would there? be going on. In fact, one author described it this way, prayer is opening your heart to God, speaking to God as to a friend. So this is a relationship thing here. Another thing is that God has commanded us to pray. If he has commanded something, then I think he means for you to do that if he's commanded you to do that. So he, that's, that's something that he has commanded us to do. And it's very important that we do that. Uh, and this is one of the means that he uses to bring us to ultimate glory. Uh, and another thing we need to realize is that when we're talking about this verse, who is he talking to? I know that this irritates some people, but... Who is he writing to, the apostle? To believers. To saints. So this is a work that is happening in saints, in believers. And that's something we need to realize. It isn't happening just to everybody, see. This is part of that relationship, that deep, close relationship. So this is happening in believers. Remember, on unbelievers, the Holy Spirit is working. But he's working from where? Outside. In believers, he is working inside. He's working from the inside. That's the difference on that. Now, don't ever let anybody tell you that you were born as a baby with the Holy Spirit. Because there would be no reason for new birth or regeneration to be born again it's in the new birth it's when you're born again from above that you are born with the holy spirit at that point so new birth is very vital if you doubt that just watch any toddler yes well oh, yes 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 um 
And then the other, some of the other conclusions we're going to look at is uh, the more spiritual a man is, the more he will pray. The, and the greater freedom he will know in prayer. The greater liberty, the greater enjoyment he will have in prayer. Because you, as a relationship deepens, what happens? You become more and more intimate. You become more and more excited. You become more and more in love, the whole thing, in a relationship. So that's uh, what, what's one of the things that happens. The more we realize the true character of our spiritual warfare, the more we shall know something about this groaning and sighing that Paul is talking about here. It does not take the place of prayer, but it is the occasional experience of one who has entered to such an extent into fellowship with sufferings. So there's some general rules about praying. Uh, number one, to start with, realize what you are doing when you pray. Realize what you are doing when you pray. Because what the passage here is that we do not always know the what that we are to ask for. So one of the first things you can do is if you can't pray and you have nothing, you know, you're, you're speechless, you're wordless, what's one of the first things that you can do and should do? Listen, the first thing that you can do, always do, is worship, adore, and praise. Always start there if you are completely empty and you feel completely empty. Always start there. Start by worshiping God. Start by Praising God. Start by adoring God. Remember Psalm 77? That's exactly what the psalmist did. He was completely depressed and down. And what it, when he caught himself, he turned around and he started praising God. And it works, folks. It really works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. But but this is where you can start. So you just start by praising him. And and then, you know, like you say, the mind will start to to open up, you know, to where you can receive. An example of this was is we find in Acts uh, chapter 4 verses 23 to 31. Uh, the background of the story is as follows. Peter and John had been on trial because of the healing of the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple. They had been set at liberty, but were with a very severe warning. They were told that if they continued to preach or teach in the name of this Jesus, certain things would happen to them, and not nice things. They had been straightly threatened. And what happened? Did they obey this? No. They kept on preaching. They kept on teaching the name of Jesus. And so they were uh, put back into prison, and they were brought, and later they were uh, taken out of prison, and they went to this. Uh, they were at this home, and it says one amazing fact that re in the in that recorded prayer is that unlike us, they did not start with themselves. They didn't start with their problems. They didn't start with their difficulties. And uh, they started with God. It says, "You, O uh, Lord, you art God, which has made heaven and earth." and the sea and all that is in them. That's what they said. Now actually what they were really doing in reality is they were praying about their problem. Because by doing that, they were recognizing that God had the power to take care of the problem. Just by simply praising God, they were acknowledging the fact that God was able to take care of their problem. And we can always do this. For, this is one way that we can always do it with prayer, without exception, 
If you are blank, you don't know what to do, start by praising God, worshiping God, adoring Him. You can always do that. Another thing is, the second principle, is that spiritual requests are always right because they are always in accordance with God's will. What do I mean by that? Number one, pray for the success of God's kingdom. You can always do that. Pray for the spread of his kingdom, for the success of his work. And that is something that you can always pray about, and that is always a legitimate prayer to pray at all times. Number two, pray for greater knowledge of God, a greater knowledge of his love, a greater knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a greater understanding of his love towards you. That is something you can always pray about. Always, without exception. Always you could pray about that. And number three, pray for greater holiness, greater sanctification, greater strength to help uh, in the battle of against, against sin. This is always right. This is always right. These are requests that you can always make uh, to God at any time, any place. In this type of prayer. Uh, Thirdly, it is always right to plead the promises of God. It's always right to plead the promises of God. Whenever you have a clear promise of God, plead it. The promise of God are meant to be used and similarly quote scripture. Now to me, the letter of Romans is packed full of promises of God. And I often in my prayer plead these promises and I bring these promises up. What daddy doesn't like to hear his child repeat something he has said back to him, see? And God loves and hear, uh, to hear this from us, to repeat these things back to him. Now let's look at uh, the second group of instructions, which are, in reality, are cautions. I would lay it down as a general principle that we should exercise great care and caution concerning personal request in prayer. This is where we do not always know the what that we should pray for because we do not always know what is right for us or what is good for us on that. So be cautious there in that part of praying. Too many people just rush off in this. And in Psalm 106, verse 15, it says, And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. In other words, when the children of Israel were going through the desert, they wanted food. And they wanted Egyptian food. They wanted flesh. They wanted leeks and onions and garlics and all these different things. Finally, you know, they they kept pleading with God for this and finally said, okay, you can have it. But what happened? They got sick. And he sent leanness of soul. And God does answer these requests. But I say be cautious about these requests. Because God will give you what you ask for. And it may not be always that good for you, see. Because you're asking for it from what? A selfish, self-centered motive. A self-centered perspective. So be careful of that. Uh, we need to all, one thing that we need to always, uh, again, when, when we're dealing with this exercise in great caution is that we need to entirely put ourselves into the will of God. We need to pray that in the morning when we are praying uh, to God, is that to be in his will, in his plan, in his purpose. In other words, I give you myself, I give you my whole being this morning. Holy Father, 
but I also give you my parts, my instruments, my tools, my weapons. Father, use me and my weapons for your glory, not for my glory. And so we need to do that every day, is that we turn ourselves over to God uh, to be used according to his will and not according to our will. And this is something we are always capable of doing, see, is to turn ourselves over to the will of God. Uh, and then once you do that, do you have the peace of God? You should have the peace of God in your life. It should be manifested there in your life because if you have truly turned yourself over to God's will, it doesn't matter how he's going to answer your prayer. See, you have peace that God is going to do what? What is right and what is good for you. And that there will be a peace about that. In other words, you may be praying specifically for something, but you recognize that God may not answer that request, so what are you going to do? Put yourself in his hands. Let that be his decision for you. And that should result with a peace, uh, the peace of God in your life. My next caution is that we should never demand anything from God and that we should never claim, and I'm using claim here in the negative sense of God. God is God and you are a creature. How dare you tell God what to do? God, I demand that you save my brother. We're to, we are not to do that, folks. There's a whole lot more involved in this great controversy. In that, that brother has a free will. You see... Yes, yes. So you cannot be demanding God uh, to do things. Um, this, this, this is very different from claiming. Demanding almost telling God what he has to do, what you require. We must approach God with reverence and godly fear. Our God is a consuming fire. The children of Israel demanded certain things in the wilderness and they got their request. But it was accompanied by leanness of soul. Be careful then not to demand physical healing. Indeed, I would add, do not even demand the salvation of someone who is very dear to you. Pray for it, but do not demand it. See, we cannot do that on that because we need to be trusting ourselves in the, that he knows what is best. He knows what's going on in, in these situations. Uh, so finally, it is... In no sense wrong, but essentially right to tell God when we are in a perplexing position that we do not know what the what to pray for as we ought. So this is always right to do. Is if we don't know what to do, let, you know, acknowledge that to God. We don't know what to do. Another thing is to be careful of some of these things uh, that goes around with faith healing and different things of this nature. One thing that I have observed in the book of Acts, I have never seen in the book of Acts where the apostles ever announced that they were going to perform miracles of any kind. They never went out on, a, on a Tuesday and passed out flyers saying on Wednesday we're going to have a healing service. You never see that in scripture. What I see in the book of Acts through the apostles, when God used the apostles in this way, there never was a failure in regards to this. In other words, when the apostle came up to you and laid his hand of healing on you, he knew before he did that that, he, that she was going to be healed already because the Holy Spirit had told him to do that there. And you'll never see a failure there. 
That's one of the things you will see in many of these movements is a whole lot of failure. And guess who's blamed? It's my faith. My faith wasn't good enough. Folks, your faith may have had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So be careful of some of these things because uh, uh, there's a lot of deceptions going around and we need to be careful of the deceptions that are out there. Uh, and they will pull you uh, away on that. One of the things that I want to stay in closing this morning is never, ever base your Christian walk, your Christian experience, your relationship to God on miracles, signs, and wonders. Don't ever base your belief on that. Does God use miracles, signs, and wonders? Yes. But don't be, base your relationship on that. We got a good history in the Bible regarding that. The Jews were obsessed with this. Totally obsessed with this. And take a look at it and see how much it really did for them. Only two people above 20 went into Canaan. And they were inundated with miracles, signs, and wonders. Didn't change their hearts, did it? It did not. Same thing happened when Christ came. Same problem. They were inundated with miracles, signs, and wonders. And what did they do with him? They put him on a cross. They put him on a cross. In fact, it was so bad that when, they, when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, they panicked to the point where they said, we got to kill Christ and we got to get rid of the evidence. Let's kill Lazarus too. That's how bad it got. Here was a miracle and they were saying, we got to get rid of this, you know. We got to get rid of this evidence. Okay, any... Our time is up. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for the third person of the Godhead indwelling our lives and all the work that he does in our lives in keeping us in your Son. And we just want to praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.